I've reviewed a lot of the risk factors for depression, but I haven't covered them all, and I'm not going to. There are just too many. But there's one risk factor that you might have heard about and I haven't talked about at all, which is odd because for many people, it's the only factor they're ever told about, and that's this. Depression is caused by a biochemical imbalance in the brain. Why haven't I said that? Well, it's complicated. What is depression? Well, in large part, it's a subjective experience. You feel it. And that clearly suggests that the brain is involved. Okay, how does the brain work? Well, largely by chemical communication between the nerve cells. So we can say with some confidence that every experience you have is a biochemical event. Love, insight, fear, depression, intention, willpower, tiredness, happiness, everything. For you to feel them, something has to be happening in the brain at a chemical level. But this is true of all human experience and all animal experience. So it doesn't really explain anything. It implies an explanation. We hear it and we develop ideas about what it must mean. A biochemical imbalance. Now for many people that implies that the problem has nothing to do with their life. Personally, I always groan to myself when a client has been told about biochemical imbalance. It's as though they're going to be walking down the street and their brain biochemistry will suddenly change and they'll get depressed and that is independent of anything else in their life. Nothing to do with their diet, exercise, the amount of social contact they have, the way that they spend their time, the job that employs them, the way that they think about the world, nothing. All depression is, is a change in your brain biochemistry that happens all by itself. Completely uninfluenced by anything else in your life. Well, as we've seen, there is a lot of evidence that depression has a great deal to do with our lives. The idea that the biochemistry changes all by itself is a pretty shaky one. And there really isn't much evidence for it. There's no blood test, for example. We don't even know what we'd be testing for. Also, think about that term, an imbalance. Between what and what? How so? Too much of something? Not, a mu not enough of something else? Okay, what? Now, the usual idea that people hear about is that their serotonin levels are low. Well. To show you more about this idea, I need to do something absolutely terrifying. I need to explain a little bit about how the brain works. Now, we're going to do this very simply. The brain is made up of about 86 billion nerve cells. We call them neurons. And even more of a second type of cell called a glial cell. Almost all the attention in neurology is given to the neurons. The glial cells are usually thought of as the helpers. They insulate and nourish the neurons and they help clean up the dead ones. Now, more recently, there have been some suspicions that glial cells may be more important than we once thought. But the work on depression really focuses on the neurons, so let's look at those. Neurons come in all shapes and sizes, but here is a really oversimplified view of a neuron. You can think of the brain as an electrical system, and a neuron as a little tiny bit of wire. Too tiny, in fact, to do much good all on its own. It transmits an electrical signal from one end to the other. In this case, from this end to this end. The signal only goes in this one direction. When it gets to the end of the neuron, the cell has to communicate with the next cell in line, the next little bit of wire. And in fact, 
our picture is beginning to fall apart already because most brain neurons actually look like this. And they connect not with one other neuron, but with hundreds or thousands. Now this is why we talk about neural nets. But for simplicity's sake, let's boil this down to one connection at a time. So if we look really closely at where a neuron connects with another, we'll see that there's a little gap between them. Somehow the signal has to jump from one side to the other. So as a signal moves through the brain, there are two types of transmission taking place. Inside a single neuron and at these jumps between one neuron and another. Almost all the attention in psychopharmacology focuses on what happens at the jumps, and this is probably right. So how does a signal get from one side to the other? Well, through chemistry. There are little bags of chemicals here in the end of the sending neuron, and when a signal comes down the neuron, some of this chemical is dumped into the gap. On the far side, there are little docking stations for these chemicals, and some molecules make it across and dock, and if enough of them do that, the next neuron fires, and the signal goes along that neuron to the next gap in line. If not enough chemical docks, the next neuron does not fire, and the signal ends there. The chemicals in the gap transmit the messages between the neurons, and so we call them neurotransmitters. Not surprising. But different parts of the brain are doing different things, and one of the ways that these functions are distinguished is that different chemicals are used in different systems. This is a little bit like a car. Cars use a variety of different fluids for different purposes. Gas, oil, transmission fluid, brake fluid, wiper fluid, and so on. Each of these has a purpose. And you really don't want to mix them up. So the brain has a variety of different neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine, GABA, glutamate, the opioids, substance P, and many more. In the next lecture, Let's talk about the neurotransmitters that are most often considered important in depression.